Yeah. Yeah, now I'm gonna talk about my latest book, which I released a bit from uh, last week. Been working on the audiobook for a while, and uh, Pimp Rush came out last week. Available via Amazon, um, Book Depository, a print and by Ingram Spark. Price around 20 25 Australian dollars, including postage. Yeah. So, the fall of Martin Orchard. It follows Martin Orchard, the titular person, and in the beginning of the book, he travels through a portal in a pyramid to another dimension. He's told by, he meets alien deities, and he's told that he needs to find someone called Kayla Eisenstein and warn her of dang that, the, the, the deceiver. He comes back to the reality, he wakes up in a hospital, and he's thinking, did I even imagine this or not? Who knows? His doctor says, oh, you had a food poisoning, you got hallucinations. It's all made up. Before he leaves Egypt, he has a short, he has a short affair with a random woman he meets up with. So he goes behind his wife's back and he has a short affair and then he flies back to, then he leaves Egypt where he's been on a holiday. A few years later, he's in Nepal with his partner and a group of tourists. And they find a technology that enables them to communicate with the Dangda, which Martin was warned about before. And she essentially tells him that obeying her is the only way he can stop the future apocalypse. So, with this in mind, over the next 20 years, Martin is traveling to different destinations, committing different crimes, in order to, you know, find medical technologies and trying to stop the coming apocalypse. Eventually, he meets Sabina Hines, which is from Sabina Saves the Future Trilogy. Which, by the way, this book, by the way, has a new cover now, but I haven't bought the print copy with the new cover. <laughs> but the new cover, if you look at uh, if you look at Amazon, the ebook e or the audiobook, you see the new cover. And he meets with her, and he realizes that she's the chosen one, and that he has to help her find, stop Rangda. And he also realizes that he's connected to the Kayla Eisenstein he was meant to find. And he does this, and at some point, Sabina, who starts out as a very innocent girl, turns she turns a bitter because people try to kill her, so eventually she turns against Martin and tries to kill him too. But Martin survives and he comes up with this revenge plot against Sabina. At the end of the book, Martin is dying in cancer and in order to, uh, in order to control his own fate, he takes a drug overdose because he doesn't want to die from a, slowly, a, can a brain cancer that slowly kills him. And he meets up with the god of the, this universe, the two maker, and he's literally told that all his actions were actually part of the big, bigger plan for the universe. So that's about this book. Yep. And how is this book? Question one. How you were talking about Sabina Save yeah, the Future. Get, uh, What's I'll, that? I will get to it. Talk more about it. I will get to it. So. How is my latest book related to my other books? Sabina Saves the Future starts in 2037. The Fall of Martin Orchard starts in 2019. So it essentially follows, follows Martin for 20 years before he met, meets Sabina in this book. So which one goes first and which one goes so after? This goes first. It's not 2019, yeah. this mm -hmm. one. Okay. And this is 2037. 37? Yeah, 2037. And essentially, Martin in the Sabina book, he's a minor character, he's not the main character, because obviously Sabina is the major character, but he's a minor character, he becomes bigger at the end, but... So you're saying the focus of the character in Sabina is Sabina herself, and yes, the focus both, of the character of Martin Orchard is in both that? Both these books are written in first person, which means the titular character... Does it happen in the same time? No, they're a few years apart. Well, they do converge to timelines. 
Because so they do the connect, yes. Then do me. Sure. Okay. Um, and, and how about the divine finalization? What's yes. that? So, both these books, both these books are a new timeline because in the end of this book, this takes place in 29th century. At the end of this book. That's in the future. Yeah, it's in the far future. Far future, yeah. In the end of this book, the villain has become so powerful, so the only way to stop her is for the true maker, which is the god in this book, to turn back time so they can stop her. So the one who was meant to stop Rangda in the 29th century is Sabina Eisenstein. But she fails, she's killed. So God turns back time. And in the alternative ending of this book, time is turned back to 2019. Ah, yes. In the main ending... So that's where that book of Sabina Saves the Future become time. relevant. Yeah, because Sabina is mm, reborn in this that's book. That's interesting. Yeah. Sabina is reborn in this book. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're supposed to read Divine Finalization first before you read Sabina Saves the Future. Essentially, these two books is, let's say... We're or do you have to do that, or can you do the other way around? Well, this book is independent enough from this book. It's literally okay. ma mostly the main character and a few things that's mentioned in this so book. So you can like read that. only those two for Martin Orchard and Sabina without having to read finalization. But if you do, it does make sense. Yes, yeah, so this, this one is more this one is more backstory about backstory. But this has completely So the backstory is actually happening in the future. In so what happened is because this is twenty ninth century, let's say we are in twenty twenty now. Time moves back. Hmm. So time keeps moving in nine hundred years, in eight hundred years, when it's in the 29th century, right? Are you saying time moves forward or time moves back? Actually, time moves forward. Forward, we're yes, in the first forward. Time. Let's say now, at the moment, we're in the first timeline. Nothing of these books have happened. Because we're in the first timeline, we move forward eight hundred years. Yep. And then something destroys the universe. Then you have to reverse the tape. Then you create a second timeline. And this is the second timeline. Mm. The second timeline. Because this is the first timeline, so this takes place before these two books. Sure. Because this is the first timeline when the universe is when the universe is destroyed and they have to reverse time. Okay. But you can easily understand these two books without this book. So when you're saying the divine finalization, it says the trilogy. Sorry, can you just remove your hand? Oh yeah. So why is it a trilogy? So is there other books that relate to that? Divine Finalization? Yeah, so it's the Divine Seat until the... I don't have other two books with me here, but it's the Divine Dissimulation and uh, the Divine Sedition. But to understand the two latest books, I find these books are complete, very different from this book, because the Seat and Trilogy is like a third person. You don't really have a... You don't have a specific main character in the same way. So it depends what your preference is. The so the, are things. they all sci-fi? Because, of course, finalization would happen in the far distant future, so everything would not look like the way we, they do now. But in those two books, they are more uh, closer to where we are now. So they look like just everyday life. Yeah, uh, so with the divine finalization, it's, it, it has a very futuristic... Uh, yeah, so this Mindset. one, because it takes place in the 29th century, mm -hmm. it's For much those people who love to read sci-fi, yeah. But these books, they're based on... What genre of... would you consider those two as? I would consider these ones to be more action-adventure than it's sci-fi. Because it's action, it's sci-fi action-adventure. There is technology, as mentioned in this, but there is no scientific meaning. It's more like fantasy taking place in the near future. So there's, the near not, future. there's not a lot of... Uh, these two books, they don't have a lot of Would you say they are thrillers or action or what? I'd say it's more like action-adventure. Uh, they're a bit mm. conspiracy as well, but oh, okay. books are conspiracy. So lots of conspiracy theories. Yeah, well, that's but good. it's mostly action-adventure, especially the fall of Martin Orchard. Mm. Uh, build... So would you be able to tell us what, sorry about that, uh, what the conspiracy uh, theory is mostly about in the fall of Martin Orchard? Yeah, and Sabina saves the future. So something to do with Mossad, isn't it? So the villains in this, uh, the, the fall of Martin Orchard, yeah. it's essentially the five most dodgy organizations in the world. It's the CIA, mm. it's the World Bank, mm. it's the Mossad. Yeah. And then you have 
the Hara Pan conglomerate, which is like a fake Indonesian company. Mm -hmm. And then you have a South, a South American organization as well. Okay, so what do they do and how, how are those five organizations related to the world? And who is Martin Orchard? Maybe you can so tell Martin us. Orchard is a titular character. And it's a what? Sorry. The main character. The main character. And essentially, like I said, the plot starts with him being an idiot on a holiday. He's just a normal, average guy. And he's modeled on me. So he's 35, he's a writer. But it's not, uh, it's not that okay. much defined so about him. Okay, so basically uh, someone but, who... And then in Egypt, he finds lucky. a portal to a, a pyramid. He so it is portal to the pyramid. Can you let us know more about what portal and to where this portal goes to? So essentially the plot is he, find, he buys a gem yep. that works as a key. So when he gets lost in a pyramid, this gemstone accidentally activates a portal to another dimension. To like he, another dimension. Building. So how would that relate to uh, divine finalization and everything else that you've so made? So this dimension, yeah. the divine dimension, yes. essentially, essentially what the plot is in all these books is a group of aliens called the Zetans. The Zetans, yeah. They have been stuck in that dimension for thousands of years, okay. acting as gods. Okay. Very so, interesting. So in this book, The Fall of Martin Orchard, mm. Martin comes there in 2019, and these settlers, they have premonitions, but they don't know everything, because they're not God. They're just aliens. They're like super intelligent aliens. So one of the settlers he meets, that setter knows that, Kay that Martin has to tell Kayla Eisenstein to warn her of the anger, but he doesn't know why. That's Who's why Kayla Eisenstein? So Kayla Eisenstein is the mother of Sabina Eisenstein oh. in this book. Oh, interesting, I see. And she's like a rebel woman, Great. a rebel fighter against the, the dictator. So hang on a second. You just said that Sabina is from the year 2019 and her mother is from the 29th century. So, so Sabina, how is it possible that her mother comes from the future? So Sabina originally lived in the 29th century as well. But she died because oh. Langdon, Langdon defeated her and killed her. So essentially the two maker, which is like... So Sabina is also in that book. Yeah, she's all she's she's like. So she was then times. reborn again in the current times. Yes. Okay, interesting. Is there anything else you want to maybe add to your interview? Yeah, so I'll go through other questions. Uh, I'm a book related to other books. I think I've told you. And um, what do I think I've improved the most in this book compared to the previous books? My biggest improvement in. Uh, when comparing the fall of Martin Orchard and Sabina saves the future, my biggest improvement, I think, is to uh, minimize the use of adverbs. Let me give you an example. Uh, English is not my first language, so it always takes some time. So where are you from? And Sweden. Uh, Sweden. And so Swedish is your first language. They say with most authors, you have to write eight, ten novels before you get a really good one. It's a tile. How many tile novels book. have you written? Seven. Seven. Well, that's not too bad. And are they all in English? Yeah. Okay. Because I'm living here, it's no point writing. And uh, where are market. you, by the way? We're in Sydney, Australia. Okay. Sydney, Australia. So, back to the question. My biggest improvement between these two books is that for the fall of Martin Orchard, I've sold out the mess. Uh, so I use this book, I use way too much adverbs. Unnecessarily. Not necessary. No, no, it's fine. So, let me give you an example. While I in this book might write things like, I, I said quietly, I said mockingly, which is not very good English. In this book, I will change it to a whisper or I <laughs> But they both mean the same thing. Yes, it doesn't really matter how you write it. What is most important is the content of the book. So, I, I, I think... In terms of I said it quietly or I whispered, they both mean exactly the same thing. So I think that you're just being over critical over the way you're writing your own books. So that, that's a big discussion. If you see uh, Stephen King on writing, in a few writing books, it says ideally you should use as few words as possible to convey the same message. And I mocked. It's a lot shorter than I said mockingly. It flows better. It's okay, so you're saying that basically the fall of Martin Orchard has a much 
fluent uh, way of writing yes. is more easily. Okay. What I think Understand. can put some people off, and so, what I think some people can like more is Sabina. Yeah. Is that it's. Uh, oh, I actually is, prefer it, that one more than the, the other books. What I think many people would like with Sabina is that it's a lot more suitable for younger readers. Yeah. The Fall of Mount Nautical is drugs, it's violence, it's swearing. And what, well, what is it? Swearing. Swearing, oh, obscenities, gosh. sex. Conspiracy and, theories. Well, there's yeah. conspiracy in both of them, but Sabina as a character is a lot pure, even though in the beginning she's very pure and innocent, and she becomes a bit worse because all these people try to kill her and so on. Okay. But she still stays relatively pure in her mind. Mm. And so this is written... And how would you describe the character of Martin Orchard? I think it is... I think it's mostly... He is mostly pushed by external factors. So say for example, after Nepal, he's, he's dying with a brain tumor. Literally in Nepal what happened is he falls out... He, he's, the, the bus is in, crashes down a, a ravine. And the he, bus that he was in? Yeah, crashed. he's in a tour bus and it crashes down a ravine. Oh, okay, what and happened then? Miraculously, he survives, but, okay. he has brain, brain in, in, but he has brain injuries. Okay. And Ranga keep coming. Who's Ranga, by the way? You keep talking about this lady called Ranga. <laughs> so Ranga is an alien with, like, an alien that's very good at manipulating people to do her bidding. She's like an evil mastermind. So is she some kind of an alien, or is she yeah, some like kind of a she's an alien goddess? Or she's like in between, like the Satans. Spiritual beings. She's a mix. She's not. The, these books only have one proper god, the Two Maker, and the Two Maker in these books is more of a passive god. It's not the god that you go. It's not the type of god you go to church so the god and pray and it helps. That you're more. talking about is the True Maker, who actually, the was the one that invent the created. Hum, human and those alien species, including the Zetans. It's the two makers that, that created, right? created the universe and then evolution took place. And so you're saying that Rengda was just one of the alien species that was created by the true maker? Well, like I said, the true maker in these books doesn't So you're Martin. saying that Rengda is a different species and Martin Orchard is obviously a human yeah. and somehow those two. Like because you said before, these books have a lot of things to do with extraterrestrial beings. So, which, um, yeah, so the books mostly is not really uh, something like a spiritual books. It's more like sci fi. So, we're thinking more towards sci fi, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's like this one, let's say 60 70% action adventure, 25% fantasy. They live in science. Uh, fantasy. So, how would you explain? Are there dragons there, or fairies, uh, or unicorns? Sci-fi fan, sci- science fantasy, sci- science fiction. Essentially, the term it's a bit loosely used. Science fiction, but many people is used anything that takes place in the future. But while some science fiction stories actually is based on real science or potential science, other science fiction stories like Star Wars. It's essentially fantasy taking place in the future. Like, okay, there's no science yeah. behind it. Same with this book. There's no science behind mm-hmm. this. They find alien gadgets that give them powers, but it's not scientifically explained how they do these things. And so your books will be more closely related to Star Wars. And yeah, I'm talking about this one here because I've read it, and it's brilliant, by the way. So it is more closely related to Star Wars, as in it happens in a far distant future. But these two are then kind of... Uh, the second timeline, as you said it, yeah. that they were reborn again to the, to the normal there, yeah. times. Yeah. Mm. Go so, ahead. Sorry, I'm the, interrupting. No, that's good. With the science fiction, generally speaking, it's a genre, but for it to be science fiction, it should be, it should be based on science. It should be a lot of scientific explanations, and none of these books have that. Uh, the first book in this series tried to do more the divine dissimulation, I don't have it here. But I don't think sci-fi books have to have scientific explanations because you're not trying to market your books as reality or something that is based on actual facts. These are just sci-fi, which means it's just a novel. Yeah, so like I said... So it doesn't really... Star Wars, for example, it happens in in a far distant future, but it also doesn't really explain the science behind... Say, for example, what is it, going back to the, uh, the past or time travels, things like that. But it does happen. So yeah. it happens. So in your books, th- there are things like that too, isn't it? So, 
Yeah, so like I'm saying, it's... Time travel, my, basically. In my yeah. definition of sci-fi, it should be have plausible scientific explanations. Uh, so my, would you be able to explain? <laughs> so my being books, annoying. Uh, my book, uh, time travel. How would you, uh, how would you explain time travel and going to another dimension through the portals? Uh, how would they interrelate in in your all of your books? Okay, traveling through the portals is because it's a multiverse, and the scientific explanation I have here is essentially that uh, if you if you concentrate enough energy in one spot. You can travel between dimensions, and one of the dimensions is the divine dimension, where time essentially stands stand still. Mm. So you can't you can't starve to death. You can be there for millions of years, essentially. Your body's not going to age, nothing. So it's just a timeless place. Uh, with the time travel, none of these characters actually do time travel. What happened is Sabina dies at this book, and the god, the, the true creator of the universe. Can set turn back time, but the characters can't travel time. Oh, I see. So, so only no the true maker that did that, so they couldn't. The god that time. created the universe mm. can do it, but okay. not random characters can't just go back and forth. Okay, sure. So what about the portals? Where do they go, and what kind of dimensions you're talking about? So they all happen at the same time, is it? No, there's, no, there's, okay. lot, there's portals to different planets. Uh, in the Divine Seat and Theology books, it's established that you can. You can open a portal between our universe and the divine dimension where time stands still, and then you can literally travel via that. You can travel via the divine dimension where time all stands still until you get to another spot in the universe, and then you come out of the portal to somewhere else, and maybe a day. But apart. yeah, when you say to somewhere else, does it mean that it's to another time, or is it the same time? Same time. No, it's so, not because when he. Well, how about when Sabina? Okay, you're the one who wrote it, but. Uh, what I, my understanding when Sabina went through the portal, she went to face Ranga at the time when she was chained in the uh, in the dungeon. So that would have happening in twenty ninth century. So no, she went she, to the twenty ninth century. She, no, she's chained in the dungeons for thousands of years. She escaped. Do you want to remove this video because no. I'm the one who looks like I'm the one who's writing it? <laughs> no. uh, in in, uh, in in the twenty ninth century, she escapes. That that means in the twenty first century, she's still locked up. And so Sabina wants to come back in the 21st century and put an end to the anger. So she doesn't escape in the 29th century. Sorry? Okay, the anger, 10,000 years ago, more or less, she was fighting against the Sita and species. Okay. And they locked her up in a prison where she's been for 10,000 years. But because it's timeless, she can't starve to death. She won't die from time in the divine dimension. In the 29th century, in the divine finalization, Rainda escapes mm. and she collects magic and crystals, mm. which essentially makes her super powerful. Yep. And when they can't stop her in this timeline, in the 29th century, because she's too powerful, the god, the true maker, turns back time to the 21st century. Yep. So Sabina is reborn, mm. so she can go and stop Rainda in the 21st century when Rainda does not have these crystals that make her powerful. So how would you connect the divine finalization? So you read that first, and then you read Sabina. But you said before that follow Martin Orchard falls before Sabina saves the future. So how would you? Which one would you have to read first? Uh, with these books, you can because they the different characters, but it literally depends who you want to follow. This one is a lot more. This one is a lot more you're reading about. It's a pretty dark and gritty story about this man. He starts at 35, he's like 45, 50. Creates a lot of crime, a lot of mayhem. And Sabina says the future is more about a young, uh, idealistic girl who's trying to. Who's so trying to you're saying that either or all, they both connect anyhow. So you could just Depends jump from. you want to follow. Yeah. And you come to the same end, end place. The end okay. dies in both these books, and yeah, just yeah. in the end, it's the same ending. Mm, it's just one is more on the mindset of Martin Orchard, the other one's on Sabina. And how are they connected? Who is Martin Orchard and who is Sabina? Or are we giving too much of the uh, plots now? I mean, they have a connection. And, yeah, how are they connected? And they actually meet in both these books at several occasions. But they also, I mean, they also have completely different perspectives. So Martin Orchard, he doesn't see Sabina as this saintly woman, to be honest. 
in this book, it's from Sabina's point of view. He's not doing anything wrong. He's just following. But from his point of view, he actually... But how are they related? Well, I mean, if you tell people how they are related, that's one of those things you want to leave. Oh, I see. So of. it's a secret. Okay, fine. Okay, so explain to us about this the cover. So who is that kid there and who, who is that woman there? Or a kid or another kid? No, so that's essentially when I bought this cover. I didn't make it. I bought it. That's essentially symbolizing Kayla Eisenstein, the mother, mm. who in the Divine Absolutely. Finalization, she has already played out her part because she's the main character of the Divine Sedition. In the Divine Finalization, she's essentially ranked as prisoner. So her daughter grows up, Sabina Eisenstein, and she's bestowed with power straight from the, the true maker. So throughout the plotline, Rangda and her, Rangda in this book, is joining up with another villain who's called Melky Odorovic, who's essentially a full blood, full on psychopath. Okay, a cannibal. So there's another character called but Melky. Yeah. I don't want to talk too, too much about this book because no. it's not the topic. Okay. But essentially, this is a third person story, mm-hmm. which means it doesn't really have a main character. That's four or five different main characters. Oh, okay. So it, it, it Lots of de- different characters. It, 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 so it's very, like Star Wars. Yeah, it very much depends on what type of book you want to read. Hmm. If you like a first-person book... I like this one too. It's very interesting to read this. If you like a first-person book, you pick one of these two. Because you see from one Those character. two are a lot thinner, isn't it? It's easy to read and you can finish it in a couple of hours. Yeah. But yeah. if you like a story, like more yeah. epic story with a lot of different characters, you get something like this. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. This one's more dramatic. Uh, let's move on to the next question. What's your inspiration for the book? So, my when I wrote the chapters for this book, okay. for this book, yes. I tried a new style of writing. I tried the episodic style, right? Epi- the episodic style. What's so, episodic style? Essentially, what happened is I don't follow Martin Orchard day to day. Instead, it jumps in. Let's say. He's in Nepal one and a half year later, because that's the next step of the plot. And if you see this kind of writing, it's very common in video games. You don't follow Martin Orchard mm. when he has to for lunch and dinner every day. Video games. So instead you jump on to the next part of the plot, yeah. which may take, uh, takes place one or two years later. He's there on a mission, and you weave in things that have happened So you would say that the way you're writing this one is completely different with the, the way you're writing so this, this one? So this one is a lot more chronological. Mm. Uh, chronological. But because... Yeah. They're all chronological, they're not jumping in yeah, time, none of yeah, them. Yeah. But this is like two months later, and both these books have a lot of time references. While mm-hmm. this book is like, you see it in the chapter heading. One's uh, more heavy book and one's light, light reading. Think, well, this two are equally easy to read. This one, I mean, if you have kids that want to read, read this one. Don't, don't give this to a 12 year old or whatever. So that's like a very dirty book, is it? It's not. <laughs> it's not like Fifty Shades of Grey porn. Okay. But it's, it's some sex, it's quite a lot of drugs. Oh. It's it's not. Um, it's not it, recommended for children. It's not like a character. It's it's not a character that provide, pro, pro, promotes good values. So okay, so. okay. So he's like a bad guy here. Yeah, it follows the villain. But it's, it's oh, also, villain! I see. He's not the main... It's, so, But he's not really a villain. Rangda is actually the villain. Yeah, Rangda is a big villain, but Rangda is not, doesn't follow Rangda. No. Just, he gets commands. Anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that depends what you like. I like the episodic style, because it shows the highlights, or so to speak, the most important things it does during these 20 years. If you jump in and take chronologically... If you're going to write a book that takes place over two weeks, you can write it chronologically, take that for the eight of the How long did you take to write this one? Um, like three or four months. Well, no, more than that, it was like six months or so. No, so what happened is, what I found lately when I write books, is that the best way to edit books is before you release the print version or... Yeah. The best way to do it, I thought, is to make the audiobook and the print book at the same time. Because when you make the audiobook, you uh, you see everything in the book that doesn't flow when you say it. And if it doesn't flow when you say it, it's not good writing. It doesn't have to be that way, because if you look at a lot of novels out there, they are not designed to uh, be easy easy to uh, speak out. So it, it's a, writing a book is not the same as speaking it out on a video or on television. 
it works the same or well it's kind of different because one's more textual base and one's conversational base so what you're trying to say these two are more sort of conversational yes but uh, this one is more like a textbook like a novel yeah how a novel should be it depends what you say you can have the narration in a book the narration in a book can be pretty uh, text-based, so to speak. Mm. But if the dialogue it's in the a book... the old approach and the new approach. Now, if the dialogue in a book's book sounds like it's text, then it's not good dialogue. The dialogue... Well, what do you mean? We've read a lot of things about George Orwell. How about those books that are, we've loved in the past? All of these books, they're not meant to be sort of conversational. Okay. Okay, they're full Let's of say, as a good example, here you have text. Text like this doesn't have to be conversational mm. because it's text, it's narration, it's described in the book. Yeah. However, if if the dialogue doesn't sound like dialogue, well, there are always going to have dialogues there. But, but if the dialogue not doesn't sound like dialogue, it's not well written. That's mm. why by making the audio book at the same time as you're making the yeah, if you make by making the audio book at the same time as you're making the print book, no. you make sure the dialogue sounds like dialogue. Mm. Because if the dialogue sounds like text. So these two are more light, light reading, more like conversational, something you can just... No, they're all uh, the same. Uh, the what is it? Digest in a couple hours and you can just understand that. Whereas a lot of other thicker books like this is a little bit more difficult to comprehend and sometimes you have to read the text again to understand what you're trying to say. Yeah? It's also because with four or five different character perspectives, shifting between characters, it's mm. harder to keep track of it. Sure. But if you only have a main character, it's by default the plot becomes a lot easier to follow. So, okay, so that's, uh, we've ha done this for half an hour now, so perhaps we can do the other books in some other video? Yeah, perhaps. I just wanted to yeah. add one more thing. Oh, okay. Um, the fourth topic is, tell us about the nine year gap between 2028 and 2037. Um, so what happened is, I found when I've written fourteen first first fourteen chapter, but first half of the book, is I found that we've already shown all the bad things that Martin does for us over the world. And what I wanted to do in chapter fifteen was for him to meet Sabina so the character change can come. I mean, if I had a world count target, I think I'd write a hundred thousand words, I could have added some more things to add just between twenty twenty eight and twenty thirty seven. But for the sake of the reader you already known what he's done. He's, done. he's killed the president. He's thrown down villages in Colombia. He has started civil wars in South Africa. He's committed a lot of crimes. And there was no point adding more things of his villain. Instead, what I found was we need him to meet Sabina at one point, midway through the book, so we get a, sh a change of character. And that's why I left a gap 2028 to 2037. And all it sums up, it does, it's written in a short paragraph of things he did in that time. Mm, okay. But you could have added many pages on that, however, it wouldn't it's have made It's not it important better. for the plot, isn't it? No, because you've already shown all the villain he has created, all the mayhem he and his co-conspirators have created. So it's not really necessary. But to it, this book doesn't really say about things that happen year by year. So it does jump every few years and sometimes yeah, every couple of months so it doesn't always have to you don't have to explain what happened every year no but if you say the first 14 chapters is in a 10 year period and then it's a 10 year period gap mm. and the reason I have a te second ten, but second this period. is not something you need to explain because a lot of books would just say that oh when you were 16 years old and the next one will be oh suddenly you're 50 years old suddenly you're 70 years old it's not something you have to explain on why you have to why you want to leave out those years. Oh, yeah. that's my explanation anyway. It's because I've already shown the first 14 chapter about what he and his okay, other sure. people are doing. Mm -hmm. And then, then the character change comes. Well, it's just, it just seems it like a, it's very repetitive. I don't think so. That, I, think, I think I kept the world count actually pretty good. It's like about 75,000 words. And 230 pages, 75,000 words. It's easy, very easy to read. What I do also is I use the um, I use the Hemingway app, which essentially tells the the reading difficulty of a text, the reading ease, how easy oh, yeah. it is to read. Yes. What, what scale would you get out of that? 
so I essentially aim for as low as possible because mm -hmm. I want it to be as easy to read as possible while conveying the plot. Okay, sure. Let's say my first books. Yeah. My first books, the Divine Dissimulation, James Locker, they would have a reading ease. Oh, so can you tell us about Divine, what is it, Dissimulation and James Locker? Yeah. Not in this video, I'm just giving you Oh, another one, sure. They have a reading ease of 8 or 9, they, which means it's a 10 grade scale. So if you have 8 or 9, that means it's fairly complicated. It's not... Complex. It's too complex because... But that makes it more challenging and that is also why people are intrigued, okay? It makes you don't always have to make books so simple to understand. It makes it more challenging, however, from my point of view, what I've found, I'm not saying I'm 100% certain on this, there's a market for both complex and easy books. Exactly, there are markets for both sides. What I find yeah, is... Style of writing. What I've found with my style of writing is I wanted to evolve it towards an easier, more accessible. Sure. Because, especially since, if you think about it, I'm not, I'm not the English major, I'm not even... I'm not even, it's not even my first language. If I try to write a language that appeals to people with their English media, they're not gonna like it. But I can, if I can convey my stories as easy as possible, I can spread it more. Okay, sure. So Fair that's my point. My point is literally to write spread it your easy, ideas. easy flow, yeah. get the story going. Okay, okay. So in this then book, I think not... Hemingway, it has a reading is of 3 out of 10. Mm. So essentially, a middle school kid could read this. But How about middle, this one here? Same thing. Yep. Both of these can be read by middle school kids. Well, would However, you just say that you're trying to uh, undermine the intelligence of smart people by making it so stupid? It's not stupid because it's easy to read. An author's job is always to convey a message as easy as possible. Some people... <laughs> some, if, it, if it's too hard for people to understand, you lose a lot of people. You want to create a work that conveys your message as accessible as possible. Mm -hmm. Plus, it's not textbooks, it's a, it's a fiction. It is, you read this book instead of watching TV. You don't read this book instead of studying high-level physics in uni. So, which means for these two books, and for comic books as well, I don't, I don't really have any project any pipeline. I just started a new project, but more months later. I'm just aiming to get it at the reading ease of three and four, perhaps. And at that level, anyone who is interested can read it. Okay. And I'm like, more interested in this one. Yeah, well. And I didn't, speaking of this one, when I made the audiobook for this one, I also simplified the Divine Finalization. It had a reading ease of 7 out of 10. I got it down to 5. So this is the new version, which is not this one, because this one I printed a few years back. But the new version of this one is a lot more accessible. Okay. That's it for now. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you.